recording. And we're live. Welcome back to episode 24 of the Rhino Podcast. It's me, Jeff Simone, with Caitlin at the Factual Prep. <sighs> Getting ready for a fabulous July 4th weekend, and I'm wearing my warm vest on July 2nd because it sucks. Weather sucks in this state. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the been- Northeast. <laughs> It was 95 degrees, I think, on Monday and Tuesday. It was hotter than hell during my swim meet on Wednesday. I was sweating like crazy. And then yesterday, just downpoured like all day, starting at like what? Like in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I like I like the heat. Um, I mean, if we're going to change seasons, fall's the best season. Oh, absolutely. Um, but, Here it's so pretty, too. But I don't mind. Yeah, it is. And you can, like, you know, especially you must love the fashion. Like, fall's like fashion time. Like, I just, you just want to survive the summer. You know, you yeah. don't want to sweat too much. You sweat through your shirts. It's gross. What do you think of these? I see these women online, these ads, uh, telling men that they have to, like, get now short shorts or something like that. And I'm just, I, I, no. Like, men's men's <laughs> legs are not attractive like maybe if you're like a soccer player or something like that but m- yeah 85 like percent of men's legs are not attractive and you do not want to see the, like the whole leg and i'm seeing like these ads where like guys your shorts are too long i i want i don't like them <laughs> tell me tell me I'm i right. just don't like cargo shorts so anything that yeah jeff Time i out. don't like cargo no, no, no. no. Not, I don't know. I'm, no, I'm not talking about cargo shorts. Cargo shorts are a fail. Cargo shorts. All right. You shouldn't wear those around. They should be for purposes like you're doing yard work or you're going hiking. Okay. I could maybe see it if you're like fishing. Right. I think an if out. If you got to put something for fishing into your pockets. Right. But. I think that if you're a man and you need all those pockets, then why don't you carry a backpack? Well, because that doesn't. Well, what looks for a backpack? I don't know anybody yeah. that would needs all the pockets. I, I think mean, it's... I'm not saying that you need a man purse. I'm just saying. What about a fanny pack? No. <laughs> What's worse, cargo shorts or a fanny pack? Cargo shorts. No. No. Yeah. That's insane. If they were not, if they were That's wearing regular insane. khaki shorts with a fanny pack, I would have more respect for them than like fifteen pockets on a car, pair of cargo shorts. Um, so a mutual uh, enemy of ours, Tom Nichols. Um, I think he muted me. I think he blocked you. Uh, he blocked me. Yeah, he doesn't like flip flops on for for men. I love my flip flops, not to be confused my, with Birkenstocks. Oh uh, yeah, I don't mind flip flops. I don't like if you got like a nice reef pair, totally fine. Rainbows yeah. are cool too. Well, I have reefs, two two pair, black pair of reefs, brown pair of reefs. Yeah, I Very mean, I, I don't mind flip flops for men. Okay. I do have to say, Tom Nichols should never be talking about the attire of anybody else that he does not like, because he always looks like a doofus. Yeah. And any picture I see of him, and I am still horrified and terrorized by that picture of him by the pool. So, again, he should never comment on anybody else's appearance. <laughs> He's not a well-put-together man to be complaining about footwear of other men. Um, yeah, he's yeah. the worst. Uh, okay. Well, we certainly wish everybody a happy and healthy, safe, uh, 4th of July weekend. We're getting it started, right? You can share this episode and enjoy it, um, over the course of the weekend while we all celebrate and yeah. have happy a- future independence day. Absolutely. Happy birthday, America. We love America. Yeah. We actually keep in mind, actually, Oh, watch this. See how many people, on the dem- in the Democratic Party, actually say Happy Fourth of July, Happy Independence Day, this or that, and which ones are like, uh, like Ayanna Presley two years ago, and oh, just so you know, um, I, the United States of America was founded on white supremacy or something like that. She did that two yeah, years ago because so she, she sucks. Because she sucks. 
Um, just know Joe that those Manson. Be- Joe Manson, what? Joe Manchin will. He'll tweet something about well, it. Yeah, but he's he's um, you practically know, Republican. Practically Republican, uh, but not really, because when it comes down to it, he'll side with the Dems. Don't you worry about yeah. it. No, the, the, yeah. it's just astounding how many politicians uh, that are in our government. Kirsten Sinema will. Yeah. But they hate, they hate the country. They just hate the country. And I know we're not supposed to say, guys, you really can't say that about people. You can't say that about Democrats. Democrats don't hate the country. Okay, maybe like your average registered Democrat doesn't hate the country. Sure. They hate, they hate people being proud of being American. Because they don't, because they're not proud of America and because they hate right. the country. Like there's a significant chunk of Democrats elected and, and the progressive voters, progressives do not like the United States of America. They don't like it. They don't right. like what it stands for. So they don't like what it operates. Don't that? give them back. Don't yeah. vote for them. Don't vote for them. Don't they vote don't for deserve them. to be in power if they hate our country. No. they And, and we should stop – they should stop pretending like they want they like the country. Um, yeah. And we should stop pretending like we have to really be nice about it. They don't. They don't like the country. We should – you, you know, if if you you should be proud of the country you live in, and if you don't like something, you should explain why it's not good and why it needs to change. But they don't like. No, we're not going. Or they like try to, and they just go into like hissy fits and all this other stuff yeah. of, and then like tell everyone they're white supremacists. Which, to be quite honest, you know, downplays actual white supremacy. You know, it is a legitimate thing, but when you call everyone one. It downplays the real thing, and so you know. Or think that the six, the think that the sixteen nineteen project is f- historically accurate, which it is not. No, it's so not. Um, and you, it, the ironic part about that is who called them out on it? The socialists. Really, they were the they were the first ones who critiqued the sixteen nineteen project, and based on the econo- economic data issues in the pieces and some of the narratives, they they wrote this long piece. I think I forgot where it is. It's on one of these socialist websites. Yeah, it was interesting. Very interesting read. Speaking of people that hate the country. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding about this. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, topic number one uh, is the Boston mayoral race. And Michelle Wu, uh, who that was a joke. Michelle Wu doesn't hate the country in, uh, that I know of yet. Uh, I'll I'll take that back if if the campaign starts to heat up because she is in the lead. Uh, Michelle Wu has uh, written an article for Commonwealth Magazine, and the folks at home are reading this right now. I'm going to read it uh, for every politics doesn't have to be about blood sport. Boston mayoral race is about change. Now that's exciting. No, it's not. Okay, let's start off right now saying it's not about change. The Democrats have run the city of Boston for decades, even 100 years, you could almost say. So no, it's not about change. It's not about it. And it is not a blood sport because there's literally no opposition. No, not in Boston anyway. yourself but, and maybe other Democrats. But, but yeah, between each other. Right. So I, I her major complaint in the article was like, was the journalists are looking for uh, a more exciting mayoral race. Um, well, we and, know a Democrat's going to win. Like, yeah, I, but the, <laughs> I guess I guess if you're a Boston journalist, there's really nothing exciting to there's nothing competitive. No, in there's the, not in the state. No. Right. So even if about the gu- gubernatorial race, even if Sonia Chang Diaz wins the nomination, it's not going to no, know. And Baker wants to run again. Baker's going to beat her. And, right. you know, maybe it'll be closer than Jay Gonzalez, um, but it's not going to be close. He's going to win by 10. Yeah, I think more. the only thing that I've seen that truly ruffled feathers in this area for the journalists was Turco winning that. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was funny. And that was a it was a, just a state. Because it was DeLeo's seat, it was just an old, I mean, it was just a regular state rep race primary. So, like, nobody really even cared that much. But Boston, because of the way Boston is being run, is not like New York City. They're not putting t- in place progressive policies, uh, they're giving lip service to them, which is good. Yeah. It's like, just talk to the people, you know, tell the activists everything that they want to hear and then do none of it and then boston will be successful like it is now crime is not as bad as new york city la and chicago thank god 
Um, we still have people that want to live here. Massachusetts was ranked second. Did you see that the other the other week last week? Ma- second second bit best place to live, Massachusetts, right behind yeah. New Jersey of all places. New Jersey. Yep, quality of life. Uh, and yes, they really like not having to pump their own gas. So, it, what 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 would make the Boston mayoral race interesting? is a candidate on the Democratic side. If you, you're, They're all saying the same things, right? They all just repeat and parrot back equity and peanut butter justice and jelly equality and all this nonsense that just, it's just word soup um, that doesn't- Climate change. Like climate, this- yeah. Oh, we need climate justice. We need this justice. And it's like, you know, none of that, there's nothing real behind that other than maybe raising taxes. They don't have an actual plan for anything. But if one person, the person that might would have the best chance of winning, would just talk common sense to people instead of towing the progressive line, you would set yourself apart and you would start to take the lead. Michelle Wu won't be that person. She's right. too well, fully like invested Eric, in it. Eric Adams in New York City. Yep. I mean, he stays off Twitter. He's not even verified on Twitter. Yep. He just... You know, he's a former, I think, what was it? He was the former chief he's of cop. police. Yeah. Yeah. Former cop. Like, he knows what's up. Like, he knows what. And the interesting about thing about that race is, is that he understands older minority voters are more conservative than the progressive younger ones. So, and they vote. But, like, that's the thing. When you speak to them, they will come out and vote for you. But in let, Boston, I don't think that's the same thing. But it's interesting. Let's let's define I'll say small C conservative, right? Not big C constitutional William F. Buckley conservative. Small C conservative, meaning not radical change. Right. Mayoral races are about, I'd say, three basic things. Crime and safety, Mm -hmm. the schools, and infrastructure. Fill the potholes, right? Yeah. The the first two are going to be big, I would assume, here in Boston and definitely in New York. After the year we had with this, uh, the mayoral candidate who, I won't even say attacks, but changes the narrative about schools and say the city schools were shortchanged, excuse me, the unions have too much power, just come at it from a different angle, our kids deserve better, whatever, you're going to set yourself apart um, in that. And granted, even when you get into office, you're probably not going to be able to do anything about it, but at least you'll have like, let, let people know where you stand if you actually believe it. Second, crime is relatively stable in Boston, but you can still go after that uh, lane and say our streets could be safer. And here's mm-hmm. why. And you point out the neighborhoods where there's problems. Um, but none of these folks will do that. It's just like, it's just straight. Uh, it, democratic socialist talking points because they're afraid to break out of that box because they're afraid the activists won't like them. Um, and, and they, they need to stop and you will, you, the one candidate that does that will set themselves apart and start to take off. Um, which I, I don't know if they will though. I I don't know if anybody, that's the problem with, with Massachusetts politicians is they're always 20 minutes late behind society kind of catching up like they won't catch like they won't see eric adams and learn the lesson you know what no I, mean? they, I don't think i mean i don't think national dems will learn the lesson right like i mean and that's one of the things that they these like democratic like even smaller candidates even in mayor or says like that that's who they pander to they pander to the national dnc because you know it's the the pipeline going into whatever they need I mean, Eric Adams is doing well in New or did. I mean, right now there's a huge <laughs> with rank choice voting. <laughs> uh, our, yeah, uh, that 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 is just that's so delicious. Watching it, it is honestly kind of I I laughed when I because that night I fell asleep really early and then I woke up to that news and when I read it I started laughing. <laughs> Oh, uh, to Jesse, Jesse Rommel and Evan Falchuk, who who just like, no, this is a superior way to decide our elections. Just watching the shit show that's taking right. place in New York City. It's like, do you, they can either they convince themselves that they're right or they're just taking the paycheck uh, because that some, you know, some progressive organization is backing it and they have to sound so smug about how it's better. It's just like it's proving it's worse. It's proving it's unnecessary. It's so funny. Um, but, but I mean, one more thing I'm going to show Wu. She wants to make like, the, the tea free. 
Like any politician that wants to do that, like you just you want to set That's yourself a up. Thing. Like it's not going to happen. But so it, why you promise this shit? It, 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 she she thinks that that the pandering that's like that's Elizabeth Warren style pandering. She thinks that's what she thinks people want to hear, but in fact they don't want to hear because they even know it's bullshit. But right. the the candidate that wants, if you want to jump ahead of Michelle Wu, you go. How are you going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for the free tea? Just put it to her like that. No, is he going to raise the taxes? What's your plan? On, yeah, what's yeah. your plan to pay for the free tea? People outside the city should pay for it. Do you think it should be what a city income tax? Like, what? Explain. She's never yeah. explained it fully, like how it will actually operate. And none of the journals will actually, none of the Boston journals will press her on this nonsense. You know, it, it, it politics is a blood sport. Hate to break it to you. Even if you want to become mayor, you better treat it as a blood sport. None of this nice – none of you have the different differentiating ideas. None of the Boston candidates have – Boston mayoral no. candidates do. The one that does, if you listen to this, you might have a shot separating yourself apart in a debate, you know, in, in activism, getting that small C conservative people who don't want radical change to take place in the city and want incremental improvement. You might get there. Don't be afraid. Yeah, don't be afraid to upset the like, you know, the young kids that say all this crazy stuff like climate alarmism nonsense or right. anything like that. Or the quote unquote activists, you know, yeah, like they the, put it in the Twitter bio. Don't be afraid to upset these people. They're young. They'll still vote for you because um, you got a D behind your name. Yeah. But you need to start saying some common sense things. Don't be afraid of the high schooler in the Markiverse. You people know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention her because she's, you know, not an adult yet. Don't be afraid of that. Be a grown up. Be the adult in the room and tell and tell people what the reality is, and you'll get a hell of a lot more respect for it. All right, topic number two: our old friends at Gen Z GOP uh, wrote an op-ed the other day. Gen Generation Z seeks the kinds of results that Republicans can bring to the table. Uh, but the party needs to engage the next generation of leaders in good faith. Okay, so by John Olds, who we've had on the podcast before, and Samuel Garber. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to read a f uh, like the first two paragraphs, uh, and then we'll get to it. As a generation born into endless foreign wars, tempered by a devastating financial crisis, and coming into maturity during a pandemic, Generation Z is, has a persistent yearning for any semblance of attention to the issues affecting young Americans. Throughout the past year, we have listened to and learned from our peers on the ground throughout the country and heard their complaints about our current state of politics. Our generation is frustrated that the political system does not care about them. Unfortunately, the byproduct of this sentiment has been the Democratic Party that feigns interest in, in us for ex in exchange for our votes. The Democrats manipulate young voters with unbelievable promises such as free health care, free education, and even though these so-called solutions are not free, substantive or even able to be implemented. Oh, I read that wrong. Uh, the frustration of young Americans is not born of the innate progressivism. It is born of the lack of choice. Uh, over the past year, we have engaged with members of Generation Z across the country with town halls, grassroots programming, and social media campaigns through the organization we founded, Gen Z of GOP. All right. Okay, guys. It goes on to list all of the issues that we're supposed to care about. And what we need to focus on, like the, like the uh, headline suggests, right? So the headline reads, uh, Generation C seeks the kind of results that Republicans can bring to the table. Now, okay. Every elected Republican in the country wants to do what it wants to do. And you can only do it in places where you have the ability to, such as... Ron DeSantis in Florida, right? He's able to pass legislation. He's able to get critical race theory out of the schools. He's able to do a whole host of things that are standard Republican policies and put into place. Writing an article in the Boston Globe that says, guys, we need to do all this. While everybody's trying to do this and you're like 
pointing out that we're trying to do, not pointing out that we're not doing it, but it needs to be done while people are trying to do it. Mean, meanwhile, facing fierce opposition from Democrats is not a productive way to go about getting the message across. Um, I don't, I'm not sure who's financially backing Gen Z GOP, uh, but I have my suspicions. It's This isn't working. Pointing out what everybody needs to do while they're trying to do what needs to be done, not helpful. Not helpful. Get involved in campaigns. Get people elected. Then implement the policies that we want and show the results and clearly demonstrate what works. Writing articles in the Boston Globe saying we're not getting done and listing out the whole host of of global problems is not an effective strategy. Caitlin doesn't like this topic because <laughs> she likes the yeah, guys. So, at Gen I, Z so, I, so, okay. So I, I have, tell me I why I'm wrong. Take. So I like John. He's a great guy and I haven't I, met him yet, but he seems like a nice guy too. Um, I, I hear your, I hear the problems, right? Like I hear it, but I think that there's a, they, they beg for us to come together and sometimes it's hard to hear a lecture from someone very young, like a, a much younger than you. I don't, it's interesting what they put in print versus what they'll say to your face, um, which I think that if we were sitting down and talking to John and Sam, they probably would say something differently and probably package it a different way. Um, so I understand, I kind of, I do understand what they're saying at the same time. I think there's better ways to accomplish what you want to do. Um, if I were to give any advice, I would focus on policy and promoting that policy change that you want to see. Um, instead of kind of seeming like you're complaining, I don't think you're really complaining. I think it seems like it sometimes. But focus, like if you if you're if you want us the GOP to become more of a party that's into like conservation, so you can combat you know climate change or any type of difference in that then talk about that more. That's where we can all come to the table and agree like, yes, we would want to protect our public lands and um, find safer ways so we can utilize energy. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, pipelines that yeah. Joe Biden shut down. But anyway, it's I, I, that's the way I kind of view it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, the, this, the, this article was full of banal platitudes. It was really just... I. I and, and, and you're right, because here's my problem, I guess, with it. It's like it's a lecture from I, I, I don't mind somebody younger telling me like, OK, here's like two issues where the mainstream GOP is out of whack with younger voters and what we think. And here's why. Right. OK. Trust me, we we complain about healthcare too. Like yeah. We still, so it, it's just like I I, <laughs> I I don't want to be you know lectured by people who haven't done anything. Sorry, uh, haven't gotten involved. You know, even maybe maybe they've helped out campaigns, but like do it help help get camp people get elected. One, um, forming your own group and then writing op eds in the Globe of of all the problems that need to be solved. <laughs> It's like there's a, there's an onion right. thing. I'm gonna I'll tweet it underneath this that there's a picture um, of <laughs> of onion of like a of a article from the Onion. It's like somebody needs to solve all the world's problems, like or something like that. I forget what it's called, but I'll tweet it out. It's like build your resume, do something, yeah. Join a campaign, help people get elected. Talk well, about. I think, John, you, I think Mr. John Olds has done that. Okay, he that, worked for Lenny. But, um, but yes, I mean, and again, we're in Massachusetts where the GOP acts like crazy all the time. We'll get into that in it's, a second. All right, we'll get into that in a second. And John would agree with us that, or we think he does, um, that we need to make sure that the state party is healthy, where we probably all agree with that. And how do we do that? We talk about it openly and we are straightforward about it. I think the difference is, is that on a national level, it's hard to kind of take the, the complaints of the youth 
and put them into policy on a national level. On a state level, it's probably a little bit easier. I wish that Gen Z GOP or anybody who's out of mass GOP that's in Gen Z, G, ah, Gen Z, Z GOP would write about our state party. That would, pro- that, would be more, that. that would be more productive. Okay. I think it would. That would be more productive, but just a, a piece full of platitudes of all the world's problems and how Republicans can are are solving them or or need to solve them the Republican way. While you're, you know, we're six votes shy in the House and it's a fifty fifty Senate, it and we don't have the White House. Okay, guys, okay, guys, thanks. Like, well, I mean, I, you take know. a look at the bipartisan thing that happened with infrastructure, right? Like we had a team of Republicans get together with Democrats. They put together an infrastructure bill and then Biden reneged on it and then tried to veto it. But then apparently he didn't really mean that, but he still wants the progressives to shove through Congress a reconciliation bill. Like we're uh, th- you can't say that Republicans didn't try. Well, but, like, but, but see, that's the thing. It's like, you know, that the, the I mean, directly um, contradictory to what the article, you know, was what it was putting forward, you know, Republicans coming to the table because I'm crossing the aisle. They to, do. To, to, but, but it's like there are forces that are against this. Like there are forces that are stopping it. And, right. you, you know, saying like, we Sometimes you need, say, you need to do this. You need. Sorry. Sometimes I don't want them to come to the table. Right. Sometimes the Republicans need to be the party of no. And I think that that needs to be more understood on on spending right now. Yeah. The Republicans need to be the party of no. That's and that's what they did with the, the infrastructure bill. I do have to say the bill that they have right now does not raise taxes at all. I think it spends old covid money on that one, which, OK, like if you're going to spend that infrastructure, no new taxes, it's not going to mess with our deficits it's we, not gonna we, we still don't have happen. we still don't have the money to do it and infrastructure i've always this is a john kennedy thing. it's a catch-all yeah but the infrastructure is takes place in a state a state should pay for the infrastructure it's absolutely asinine that people of massachusetts pay for a bridge in you know georgia like that doesn't make sense like people of georgia need a bridge they should pay for their bridge, just like we should pay for our bridges and roads in Massachusetts. And we, we do, do, right? We don't we need <laughs> like the, the, perhaps, perhaps nuclear power would be like the one thing that you could say if that's infrastructure, we're going to build more nuclear power plants, which some of the progressives are actually finally coming around to if they want to save the earth. Um, but yeah, but aside God. aside from a, a few things, infrastructure needs to take place within the state. It is, but. You know, it's like we're we're responding to this, and and fine if you want to debate it, you're you're welcome to come on, and we'll talk about it. But just this tone and whoever's pushing it, because there's somebody pushing it, and th- this the the lecture from from the youth about how, how we need to save the world uh, is do- doesn't sit well with the way it comes across, and especially in in the venue, uh, in the medium that it's taking place in the Boston globe. Um, it's, it feels a bit more, uh, like you're being used. So, you know, the article came out first, we're just talking about the article. So always remember that, you know, when when the shots were fired, but, uh, speaking of more, uh, GOP, um, sort of dysfunction (laughs) next up. (laughs) So let me pull up our, uh, Again, I had a I had a great time at the Young Republican State Convention. Oh, yeah, Mass- t- no, the Young Republicans are in are in good shape. If you're if you're under forty, uh, and you want to get involved in politics, get involved in a in or in an organization that will help campaigns and actually affect real change, you should definitely join the Young Republicans. You have to be under forty, um, over eighteen, above under forty, and be a registered Republican in Massachusetts. Um, and, and you can get involved with some good stuff, some fun stuff, but this, uh, for the audience at home, um, let me share it with you, Caitlin. This was, this was posted and then deleted, right? On the Facebook page, 
Massachusetts Republican Party, the truth matters. Follow the science. This is from Cardinal Robert Sarah. Gender ideology is a Luciferian refusal to receive a sexual to re receive a sexual nature from God. Now, you might, one might, agree with that statement personally. I would say, you know, there's a lot of credence to it, um, and I'd love to discuss it in a philosophy class. But if you're a political organization, it might not be the best thing to post on your social media. Just saying. Nope. Okay, I, I've i made it very clear that I'm Catholic on this podcast and on Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm Catholic. Uh, I'm not Irish Catholic like all of Boston is. I'm technically French Catholic because um, my mom is from Louisiana and their family originated from France and then Canada. Um, so my dad's Presbyterian, ironically, but anyway, I'm French Catholic. Um yeah, like, why are you posting that on your social media? Like, why does well, why it was do you... it was deleted? Remember, it was deleted. I think it was, was it? I, we, did we get a confirmation it was deleted? I, I don't. I don't know. I thought someone told us that it was deleted. Okay. I didn't. All right, but go ahead. But Sorry. it was posted. I don't know why you're posting a religious quote from a Catholic cardinal. And trust me, I'm a Catholic. We kind of need to, as much as possible, stand on principle and keep that stuff as separate as possible. But also, I mean, Jeff, we've talked about this subject before. The mass GOP really needs to focus on actual issues right now that are affecting Americans, especially people who live in Massachusetts. Um, our gas prices are through the roof. Um, families are seeing the effects of um, inflation on their wallets. They're seeing the police getting demoralized and all these other things on a national level. Um, why, why is the SGOP not saying a word on this? It is extremely frustrating to get fundraising emails where they're not talking about any of these issues. You have the perfect, perfect opponent in, in the Democrats but you're talking about cancel culture. You're posting a picture of a Catholic cardinal on Facebook. But they're like, all, they're talk also, the they're, issues. They're also getting cancel culture wrong cuz they think they're being canceled. Like they, this is the ultimate boomer like mistake of not getting it. They just don't understand. Well, no one you're not going to understand what, anything. You're going to fundraise 200 bucks off that and call it a victory. It's not it's not a victory. The, I mean, it's like every single one of these emails just doesn't matter. It does not matter. The, like <laughs> a, a true functioning Republican Party in this state could run parallel to Governor Baker, not agree with him on some stuff, but still move the gravity of the conversation to whatever we wanted to. We could. Yeah. We could You're move. You're stronger it. if you it, but you, you would be stronger if you moved towards him and worked together. You and I have been preaching to the choir right like you keep saying that same thing we we both keep saying that same thing the people who are in the mass gop keep not doing this and it hurts the entire state party it it and it, and it won't change and and i've accepted it but i'm going to keep pointing it out because they need to know like this, for the audiences that are involved whether you're going to whether you're on the state committee or whether you vote for state committee members you need to know that there's a better path forward than the chuckleheads that are do, there right now right yeah you, you can be one of the normals you, like us yeah you need to be a normal you need to be a normal join the normals um because we have the solutions to actually start advancing it. So what a perfect thing would be to take take a candidate who's in a competitive district against the Democrat who's had bad votes on law enforcement or school choice or whatever and pair them out and push them and yeah. and go after the issue and use your media strategy that way. This advice is free, guys, by the way. Feel free to take it. Any, it's anytime. so free. Um, We're but but, <laughs> but you, you, you could develop a whole strategy going forward. Use the, va use the vast resources that are possible. Um, we don't have them now because we're broke because they've piddled away everything. But this it, it is possible to, you know, support the governor, 
disagree with him on some stuff, parallel run the party, move the center of gravity uh, of of the state to be less progressive and more big C and small C conservative. But they can't do it. Here's the thing. It's like, like I said the other week, it's like asking me to play quarterback for the Patriots. It's just not going to happen. It, they, they don't have the capacity to do it, right? I don't have the capacity to quarterback the Patriots. They don't have the capacity to do what is necessary for political party. But you can tune in here and know that the next time changes, there's an opportunity for change when we can vote out state committee members that don't understand any of this and aren't moving the ball forward. We can get rid of them. We can elect new leadership, uh, and we can actually change things in a positive direction and for the whole state and better the state at large. So right now, uh, they don't get any of that. And um, and then by the way, if you're one of the Gen Z GOP people, if you're in that in that mode, if you're in the state. Move to a, a state committee race, move to a district, and run for state committee. Right there. Right there, you're automatically, you know, you're automatically making a positive step forward. So, so anyway, um, more dysfunction, more of a shit I mean, show. it's just, yeah, I mean, like, we, we I, I do have to say it was like one unspoken thing when we were at the young Republican state convention, like the dysfunction of the state party was pretty unspoken, but it was very obvious that people all, most of the people in the room felt the same. Most of the people, not all of them. Yeah. There's a couple that, that won't, that are, you know, that think that there's a person in leadership because they have the title that they know what they're doing. Um, and they've chosen a side fine. The rest of us will be on team normal. Yeah, and and we'll and we'll we like I said, it'll take a while. Little by little, though, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll have small victories until we just excise them from the organization in order to move to a more productive future. All right, join us on the Patreon. Great Patreon yep. episode we just recorded. Patreon dot com slash rhinopod. Patreon dot com slash rhinopod. Only a dollar a month. Uh, that's like 25 cents an episode. It's best deal going. Uh, you get to see our smiling faces a little bit more and be clued in. Uh, we're going to be putting it together an event come September. Um, yeah. And if you're a patron member, uh, you will get in for free. Um, yeah. You just got to subscribe. But uh, do so. And other than that, have a happy and healthy, safe 4th of July weekend. Independence Day. Happy Independence Day. God bless America. Happy birthday, America. Be proud to be an American. This is the greatest country in the world. And if any of your friends have a hesitancy saying that this is the greatest country in the world, dump them. <laughs> or just keep repeating that keep re- keep re- America is the greatest country in the world. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, we have the ability just to say that over and over and we again. We always keep going forward. Yep. We will always stand tall. We, no matter what, we're proud of our country and proud of our founding and what our ideals are, and we keep working on them. So, amen. All right, everybody. Have a great Fourth of July and happy Independence Day. Bye bye. Bye, guys.